Hello everybody, this is Amin and that's Rory and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About. Uh, in this episode, okay, uh, I'm just going to tell you why Rory is here instead of Alex. So Rory just got back from uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas and that's a show where uh, all the newest, latest technology is being shown. <laughs> uh, and Rory had a chance to take a look at uh, a few or a lot of it and he's going to tell us the interesting things that he saw on the CES floor. And incidentally, while we're talking about what he saw at CES, um, in this episode, we're going to focus on the technologies that we're going to see or devices that are going to come out this year. So um, if you want to know what can you expect for 2020 in terms of devices and technology and everything else, <laughs> and everything else, you can uh, enjoy the show. So, without further ado, let's begin. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> what is going on. My phone. Why is my iPhone picking up? Okay. So, why, uh, before we were rudely inter interrupted by technology. Thank you, Siri. Um, where? Okay. Where were we? Okay. We're gonna talk about the devices that you're gonna expect coming out uh, this year, and maybe trends in technology that that's uh, coming out this year. All right, okay, so enjoy the show, everybody. Uh, and then let's get right at it. So, Rory, can you just tell us what was the big theme of CES 2020 this year? So, I think CES in general is like a look into the future, right? It's mm. like the, of all the conferences that I've been to, and I'm sure you can uh, uh, confirm this, uh, is that CES is like always the things that you see looks really cool mm. like whoa this is the future but then they never actually turn out <laughs> like nothing actually ever happens yeah. with it for at yeah. least like a few years because it's like always like uh, we, we like to call it like the vaporware show yeah. um but so which is why i it's think it's typically like, american la. yeah not only typically show, american no but go. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's what you meant yeah 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 i, I was going uh. for more like it's normally in the american market uh -huh. okay, but yeah that that works too yeah. so yeah so i think with a show like this uh, it's really like a, a good way to look at like where companies are headed mm. in the future, mm. like what they see, like the future of cars mm. are, because automotive is a big part of CES. Mm. What they see, the future of uh, especially uh, consumer electronics like mm. TVs and uh, you know, home machines. appliances, uh -huh. fridges and yep. all that. So they had a lot of those kind of tech mm. there. Mm. Not so much on like mobile uh, that we normally get from like something like MWC, for yep. example. Mm. So, but a lot of the stuff there is like very futuristic. So I would, it was my first time there yeah. and it was, uh, it was a pretty good show, yeah. It was really exciting well, as someone who's interested in tech. What was like the overall theme though? I mean, okay, so I read some of the reports at CES. I didn't like see like really major headlines other than the Sony car. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I, mm. I mean, there, there wasn't like a lot of a takeaway. Um, so you said that it's like a look into the future, right? Yeah, so, so I don't know if there's like a specific theme because yeah. um, the way CES is cut up, it's cut uh -huh. up into like different kind of segments. But it's not so the theme. Like what I mean is like, what is the take away, uh -huh. like the take out that you get? That the future is <laughs> <Vapor> very... <laughs> exciting? It is, it is very exciting, but it's also quite unexpected. You know, I mean that's pretty standard. In, that, that's in, that's in what f a future. That's what future is, right? Well, you could say that, but at the same time, um, with stuff like trends, uh -huh. with stuff like uh, leaks, uh -huh. you know, we kind of can tell where yeah. the future is going yeah. towards. Like, you know, with five G, mm. with the possibilities, you can see like, okay, so you know, we can expect these players to mm. make a move. Mm. But then suddenly, Sony's like, okay, you know what? We've got a car for you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's that's what I mean okay, by, okay. by unexpected. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, I guess it's not, it's unexpected in a, in a sense, but mm. in retrospect, it makes sense because technology is like bridging all the gaps mm. between what you would consider like traditional sort of industries like motor, like, like you know, cars mm -hmm. and also like smartphones. Mm. And then you never think that Sony would be involved in like making a car. Mm. But then if you actually think about it, because like the Sony car, which we will like touch on mm -hmm. a bit later, mm -hmm. you know, it makes sense because mm. all the components that you would need for like a modern autonomous car, mm. you know, Sony makes them. Mm. Okay, now that you mentioned it, I think what I just realized is that this year, 2020, is kind of like the dawn of like really the future. Like before this, like 1999, uh, no, not 1999, <laughs> 2019 and <laughs> 20, <laughs> 2020. Okay, so 2019 and below that, right? The 10, the 20 years, uh, the 19 years or whatever, yes. right? It's kind of like the lab 
where all this like I don't I don't have the good words for this, but it's all this primordial technology is coming up. You know, all the version ones of mobile mobile tech, uh, mobile uh, mobile networks. Yeah. Um, like the setup, right? So yeah. it's setting up for yes. this next. Decade. Now it's already like matured, yeah. and with the advent of five G, everything is now possible, and you don't have to wait for a runway of ten years. You can see. A lot of the things that Roy is going to talk about and where we're going to talk about is going to happen within three to five years, mm. and 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 I'm seeing that happening in 2020. Yeah, but but okay, let's let's be real. Let me just get something out of the okay. way. I think people are over romanticizing this 2020 thing. <laughs> okay, 2020 is just another year. It's 2018 to 2019 is a year. 2019, yeah. 2020. To me, it's just another year. You know, it's it's like yeah, it's it would be cool that if like you know, what was in 2020? We have flying cars. <laughs> yeah. We have like you know. What, what else is there? Flying buses. <laughs> I'm just saying flying versions of like regular stuff that we get. <laughs> flying trains. But you know, it, it, it is still just a year. So people who expected so much from it, I think would be disappointed. But that yeah. being said, you know, with the development of technologies, yeah. that kind of curve, right? Yeah. So with like, uh, like you said, the first 10, 10 years from mm. like uh, 1990 <laughs> to, to, to 2019, yeah. you have that, you have that, um, Build up yep. the setup, the the rapid growth of mobile technology, yep. Yep. Uh, both in the network space yes. and also in the devices that we use. You yeah. know, and now we're primed for uh, the next ten years yeah. to really like we don't have to think so much about mobile mm. technology, but rather what it can do, mm. right? Mm. And that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I guess twenty twenty is a big deal maybe for Malaysians lah because uh, <laughs> that was kind of like the deadline. What what is it now? Uh, 20, 20, 20, 2053 20, or something like that. I oh can't remember. God. You guys maybe can drop the <laughs> can drop the correct new deadline for Malaysia <laughs> to become a developed country. Uh, I, f I forgot what it is. Um, but it was a deadline for us because we were supposed to be like a developed country by 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 this year by <laughs> twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but not enough it seems, um, and some some step backwards. Yeah. So more of like making it a big deal. It's more of like a line that. Our coming of age has become a disappointment. Yeah, I guess I guess it's kind like of. a it's like a wake up call, right? Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. you know what? We're gonna screw like for me at least, right? We're gonna okay screw the government and whatever, right? If I want this country to move forward, right? I'm gonna take it by my own hands and I'm gonna move it forward. So I hope you guys, uh, you know, come and join us do together and do that together with us. So that we all work to become to make Malaysia like a really awesome country. Okay, so this is not a campaign. <laughs> let's uh, let's get that out I'm of the in, way. I'm in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> let's get that out of the way. We're now going to talk about the amazing things that Rory saw at CES 2020. All right, Rory, take it away. Okay, so um, CES really big convention. I wish I could have spent more time on the show floor because yeah. there were so many things that I had to like basically run through. Yeah. Because you know I didn't have I had like a day and a half maybe less mm. at the on the actual show floor so i didn't get to try everything there was so many stuff like there was like a flying taxi <laughs> that you could sit inside yeah there was that like, really flew or what? uh it was flying in so much that the propellers were spinning but it was still on the ground lah. Um, and then there was also they, they had a drone version of that in like a cage to show you what it would look like <laughs> like, like a, like a <laughs> scale model yeah yeah it actually just looks like some <laughs> propeller strapped to a styrofoam uh, box lah. but you know it is what it is That's american show man <laughs> <laughs> we can also do a CS like that. Yeah, I think we should do that, right? Yeah, SCS. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so there were a lot of like uh, cool things. They had a lot of demos there which was surprising to me. I didn't know there were so many demos mm. and uh, since I was there actually on the third and fourth day, mm. there weren't that many people. Um, but you know, Because it's Vegas, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, they might as well just... Yeah, they probably got lost know. in the casino. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I did get to see some cool highlight stuff, uh, mm. like uh, a lot of the more tangible stuff, you know, mm. stuff that actually is, uh, I don't want to say real, but more real, I guess. Um, so one of the first things was, of course, the Sony's new car, yeah. the Sony Vision S. So mm. just to clear the air, Sony is not making a car. You know, they're not actually saying like, okay, we're we're in we're the gonna we're gonna now. we're gonna be a proton now. We're not gonna make we're gonna make the next uh, Sony Waja. Yeah. No, no, it's not gonna be like that. Um, it's the the Sony Vision S, which uh. is the car that they they designed okay. uh, from scratch. They designed that with a whole bunch of partners. Mm. So basically, they they 
they looked at the automotive, uh, they looked at the car as the next step for mobile technology, mm. for mobility and stuff mm. like that. And they were like, okay, how can we bring our expertise into this field, you know, mm. to showcase what we can do, what we already have, which is why when I said earlier that if, if you think about Sony making cars, it doesn't seem to make sense, but then actually think about what it means to make like an autonomous car, Sony's technologies are all there. So the mm. Vision S is like a proof of that concept. So mm. they worked with partners, they worked with like basically like the Foxconn of making cars. Mm. And then they, they, so they got all their partners to supply stuff that they don't make, like mm. the tires, the rims, the, the, you know, the body and mm. stuff like that. Mm. But all, it's, it's all designed by them. Mm. And then um, the stuff that they do make, uh, stuff like uh, for sensors for autonomous driving. So mm. they have camera sensors. So you, the car is actually outfitted with Exmor RS sensors. You know, you have like all their camera sensors basically to mm. act as vision sensors for autonomous driving. Mm. and then you have the screens uh, on the inside which is actually one of the cooler implementations so mm. instead of like a Tesla which is like basically an iPad on a dash mm. this one is like a whole dashboard it's a whole row like across a wrap yeah it's a wrap around wow. and you can grab one screen and like flick it to the Ooh, other end. Okay, so that's, that, that's, stuff. that's what they were talking yeah, yeah. I didn't get to try because like it was cordoned off and I couldn't oh, go you in. didn't get to go inside no no I didn't okay. get to go inside but I could see I could see other people having fun inside <laughs> oh yeah, what? and then uh, the other thing that Sony does very well mm. is with uh, sa- with audio yeah, technology. So sure. with the car, mm. they have the whole three D uh, surround sound. So you're supposed to get like a really realistic sort of uh, surround sound experience mm. in your vehicle mm. as you let it drive itself. Wow. Yeah. So uh, okay, essentially it's like a showcase to tell car makers, hey guys, you know we're you know, don't talk to Bang and Olufsen or don't talk to Garmin or whoever, we do this too. Exactly. And if you want to like, and we do it good, right? Yes. So Sony makes great cameras, uh, great speakers and I think okay displays, not bad displays lah. Yeah, and four, I mean, they only have the first 4K smartphone <laughs> in the world. I mean, it's okay, yeah. I guess. <laughs> and, 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 you know, having that in, yeah, I guess, I guess that, that would work. Um, and so we're, we're talking about future of technology, right? So. It's good that Rory brought up the car as the first thing because um, I think in 2020, in this year, uh, you're going to be able to expect cars becoming more teched up. So again, it's in 2019, you see like this Frankenstein-ish kind of like unfinished concept. Not concept, but the cars you get on the road are, are okay. Uh, you know, you have your 360 camera, la, your blind spot detection and everything, but they're not... They're not like not there yet, right? In terms of like your mobile phones, because people now expect the experience to be seamless. And with the advent of five G, right? Um, I want to be able to go into my car, and my phone is connected to my car already. So if I was like, because right now if you're doing it, and and I I hope you understand what, where I'm getting at, how it feels clunky. Because right now, let's say I'm listening to my Spotify, and then I'm, I get into my car. I have to wait for the car to start up get the Bluetooth connected or get the CarPlay connected and then the song will continue. So that's a bit of a lag there. With, with, with this, your phone will be like seamlessly connected. Before, uh, already after you unlock, the device knows that, hey, you're, you're, I'm near my car, uh, get ready to do the handover and things like that. So uh, I'm not talking about like full-on autonom- autonomous vehicle. So that's, that's going to take at least another five years because legislation is important. Uh, you know, rules and everything is important, but you're going to be able to see now technology, mobile technology or mobile-based technology coming into vehicles more, um, uh, how, how would I say, more integrated. Yeah, especially with mobile uh, maker, mobile technology makers like Sony joining yeah. the game, you know. Yeah. Uh, one of the demos actually, now that you brought up yeah. the whole like listening to Spotify, uh-huh. Heavy Connect, um, the Vision S, actually one of the demos on the screens that they showed off was that the car will be able to recognize when you are there yeah. thanks to your mobile device. So mm. when it comes in, uh, it will know that it's you. So you don't, yeah. you just un- you just get into the car and then the screen will greet you with everything that all, you're doing. All your setup, yes, right? Yes. And then, and then like... So it's like a Netflix account. Yeah, almost. I'm thinking like maybe you can have an app on your your phone right and then you can set it up the way yeah. you want it to yeah. like okay I want my temperature to be as much uh, before I go in I want the windows to be just slightly open and then and because of 5G and everything as you approach the vehicle it does that already for you in like basically real time yes you know? and and we're not talking about this as like hey it's gonna be happening I don't know when we're talking about hey this is gonna happen I'm predicting this year so Wow, yeah. very bold prediction. <laughs> I could be wrong. 
I, so. I've, I've steered clear of predicting things now. <laughs> um, no, but you know, if, if Rory predict things, then you know it's not going to happen. So, <laughs> so you... Oh, yeah, so that's right, kind of like a prediction. I guess so. Oh. I'm setting up other predictions. Yes. You're right, you're right. I'm the, the previous 10 years. Right. Okay, but so what's your takeaway of the vision S? I think um, the thing that actually surprised me the most was how complete the car was. Because like... If it's just a proof of concept, uh-huh. you don't really need to you make could it just do go. like a half cut. Exactly. Oh. Or like just a shell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they even published sort of like 0 to 60 numbers, uh, range. I can't remember what it's they are. It's an electric, they were. electric yes, vehicle. Yes, it's a dual motor electric vehicle, four wheel wow. drive. Uh-huh. And uh, it works, basically, it works like an electric car. They even had a charging station there with like traditional sort of like, you, you know, those electric car yeah, chargers yeah. Hooking, hooked up to it. Yeah. So that was like actually really surprising. Like, why did they go so far, you know? Mm, and, yeah. and I guess that's a good thing also uh, because you can tell that they're really all in on this. You know, it's not just going to be like vaporware or at least it, it, it looks like they're trying not to, to let that happen. Mm. It also looks really good, which means that uh, it's just good news because people who design uh, smartphones, Sony makes nice looking smartphones, I'd say, mm-hmm. you know, in the past. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, maybe not so much, lah, but in the past, they, they make really nice looking smartphones. Yeah. And the car looks really good, like yeah. the satin finish yeah. on, the, on, the, on the paint, the, the way the logos are like one straight line and then just as it's about to reach, it goes like, uh. mm. I like that a lot. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was surprising how complete it was, and it really shows like you know they're all in on this, and that's a good sign. I'm just looking at the pictures, mm-hmm. uh, oh, which you can check out on uh, Sir Chin Chow's Instagram, yes. my Sir Chin Chow, it's my photos. <laughs> it's not you can bad. follow me also on a uh, Rory Kurti. It, it's kind of like Tesla-ish, but okay, never mind. Yeah. All right, so that's uh, that's automotive. Uh, what you're going to expect coming in 2020 and beyond. Uh, the next thing that you have on. Uh, What's so next? The next thing is a, a look in the past. Okay. <laughs> Not really in the past, but the current. So it's even more grounded. Um, I got to check out the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Lite and okay. the S10 Lite right. ahead of, uh, I'm assuming it's launched in Malaysia because we don't know whether it's uh, going to launch in Malaysia okay. or not. Um, but I got to check out those two smartphones mm. and they were like really peculiar phones to me okay. because it uh, didn't before, seem Before like you go into that, okay. um, just a little background. So Rory, did the, Rory had oh, yeah. uh, hands-on uh, with the Galaxy S10 Lite and the Note 10 Lite and in his report on SirGenshaw.com he asked the question why do these devices exist? Yeah. Okay, so, so now you, can you explain? You, you can actually go and watch that video now I will, I will we'll wait here for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Uh. So I'm assuming now everybody has watched it. Okay. So basically, um, the, the thing that I was pretty... Uh, the thing, the question that I wanted yes. to answer was yes. like, why does why do these exist, right? Uh. Because we're just on the cusp of the next generation of Galaxy S smartphones yes. or Galaxy flagships. Yes. We don't know whether it's going to be the S twenty or mm. S eleven. Okay, it's probably going to be the S twenty. S twenty. And then yep. the next generation fold. You yep. know, we have we have we're just we're li- like a month, maybe two Less months than away. That. By the no, I think by the time you watch this, it's already yeah, launched. exactly. Yeah. So the <laughs> the fact that they are launching again two new phones. Mm. Uh, with the previous generation smartphones uh, monikers mm. as new phones now seems a little bit uh, weird. Like, why do they why did they need to do this? Like, mm. why not um, hold out for the next generation mm. and launch it together? Mm. Or you know, just have your current generation and and sort of slash the price. So for if you if you don't actually mm. if you don't already know the, the specs for the smartphone, mm. they are like a big sort of mishmash of like a whole bunch of like technology that Samsung already has. Mm. So the S10 Lite, that's powered by a Snapdragon 855 processor, mm. you know, which is still good. It's mm. still considered Qualcomm's flagship mm. um, because we haven't seen their new processors mm. yet, mm. Uh, at least not in a smartphone. And then you have uh, about 6 to 8 gigs of RAM and uh, 120 gigs of storage. Mm. You've got a big 4,500 milliamp hour battery. You've got a nice 6.7 inch uh, Super AMOLED display, Full HD+, plus, pretty mm. good resolution. And you've got a new triple camera setup. So there's a 48 megapixel main camera. So Samsung's all in, you know, with their GM, mm. uh, their, their 48 megapixel sensors are like pretty popular. And then they've got, a, you know, the, like a macro and an ultra wide. Mm. So the specs, specs wise, it's pretty good. Mm. The Note 10 Lite is also pretty similar. So it also has a flagship processor, but it's the previous generation Samsung Exynos flagship. So okay. it's the 9810 not the 9820 that is in the current S10 and the 9825 that is in the current Note 10. Mm. It's actually the one that you find in Note 9 Mm. and the S9. 
So you have that processor. I mean, it's okay. It's still a very capable processor. Mm. Like I wouldn't say a Note 9 is like a low-pet phone now. Mm. Uh, but the difference is that it has a different triple camera setup. So it's 12 megapixels all around, and you have telephoto, wide, ultra wide. And then you also have a big battery and the same same screen. So those are like pretty good specs, I would say. Yeah. You know, but the my the thing that caught me off guard was actually how they felt. So mm. if you think about a Samsung Galaxy S flagship or a Note flagship right now, yeah. right, they're like the S class of of the smartphone mm. world, right? It's the best, the cream of the crop. And mm. I've done a lot of like deep dives into mm. these series, the S series, the Note series. Mm. You can all watch them. Uh, not you, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> we can all watch them on uh, suggestionshow.com. And, and, and the, the, the common theme is that every time these phones come out, you know, they are like the best of what we have and mm. maybe a glimpse of the future. You know? mm. They're always super premium built you know, uh, ever since the S, um, I believe it was S6. It's like amazing, amazing build, amazing mm. quality. Mm. Like you feel like, okay, this is like a quality Like smartphone. no compromises, yes, right? Yes. So they could just throw everything into yes. the phone. And, and even uh, when they came out with what was considered the light version mm. of the smartphone back then, which was the S10e, mm. that was still like, you know, you could feel the Galaxy S pedigree in yep. that. You know, it was still like a Galaxy S smartphone. Yeah. But these devices, the light smartphones, mm. which are considered, uh, they consider light flagships, mm. They don't feel like that at all. Mm. You know, they first off, the back is no longer glass. Mm. It's a material they call glastic, which is basically the same material you find on their A50s and their uh, affordable mid-range smartphones. Mm. These are like what I'm calling, what I'm thinking about is like a thousand ringgit smartphones, okay. which are not bad. They're actually pretty good. And I, you know, I'm okay with Samsung making affordable. Uh, ex- premium devices, yeah. uh-huh. you know, because the specs are pretty decent yep. and they have all the resources to do that. But why name it after your premium high-end flagship yeah. line? You know, yeah. it's like if Mercedes made like the S-Class Lite and then it's actually like a <laughs> kanjil. Fabric seats. <laughs> <and> <laughs> Fabric like, seats, you know. uh, plastic bumpers, <laughs> they are off-coloured, you know, and like then wheels that are wheels. too small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why you, I don't know why. So, uh, so when you use a phone like that, right, you have the sort of... Uh, it's it's as much a, a good phone as it is a good experience. Yes. You know? Mm-hmm. And with, with the light phones, I, I I have to say I don't think they deliver on an experience. And mm. especially if you consider the fact they don't have stuff like um uh, water resistance, mm. for example, and they don't have wireless charging. Mm. Even the the Note 10 Lite that still has a, at least it has a three and a half millimeter headphone jack, mm. but the S10 Lite does not also. So it's like it's it's a weird mishmash and it's a weird kind of Frankenstein device that I yeah. I, I just feel like it cheapens the prestige yes. that is the Galaxy S and Note line. Okay, I get where you're coming from. I mean, I don't mind not having a wireless charger, mm-hmm. uh, wireless charging capability, but now that you mention all these things, right, it's better for the device to be a Galaxy A Plus yeah. rather than a Note 10 Lite. Exactly. And now that you mentioned, that you're, when you started to say that, oh, you know, um, with iPhone and everything, right, so Last year's range of iPhones, the iPhone 11, 11 Pro, and 11 Pro Max, um, made it very easy for somebody who wants to buy an iPhone and don't know what which one to buy um, to choose because uh, the pricing was right and the feature sets were really well, distinctive. Well, pricing is right for Apple products. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, <laughs> if I'm uh, if I can't afford like the Max, which yeah. is the ultimate, I'm gonna get like. So should I get the 11 or the 11 Pro? And the distinction and feature set was clear, uh, and it made it it made it very easy. And Samsung could very easily go the Apple route in how you mentioned it, right? So after the S twenty uh, comes out, they could just rename the S ten and tweak it a bit and call it the S ten something else, mm-hmm. and it could be cheaper, but it's still desirable because it had the same it will or it could have the same qualities that you mentioned. And, yeah. and and the important thing about the iPhones is that the DNA is there, you know, across the line. Yeah, it doesn't compromise yes. on the feel yes. and the, the 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 sort of the experience that yeah. you get, you know, yeah. which is which is important. Yeah, the screen's kind of like, uh, but you know, you can see. Okay, so they chose to to do this, so they don't have to sacrifice on mm. this. Which I, I've been using the iPhone 11 for like uh, the past few months. Since it's yeah, it's since launched. it's launched. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. and and you know, I have to say that. Yeah, the screen isn't the greatest. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I do don't feel like I do feel the pinch yeah. of not having a telephoto camera. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's still I still feel like it's an iPhone, like it's a flagship, it's a proper yeah. flagship iPhone, and and that's a really good experience. Now, of course, saying all of this about the Note 10 Lite uh-huh. and S10 Lite, I'm I'm saying mm. this without actually knowing the price. Now, if the price is really incredibly good, but they cannot price it below the A. 
Exactly, yeah. which is which again <laughs> comes in the problem because the Galaxy A, like the A80, for example, mm-hmm. that's quite a pricey smartphone. Yep. So if they were to drop, so that means if the Galaxy Note 10 Lite or the S10 Lite is closer to uh, A to the A, mm-hmm. or if it's more expensive than mm-hmm. an A, then you're encroaching into like you can get an S10 for for like not much more. Or you can get like an uh, yeah an S10. E, right? Oh, an S10 E or proper For S10. probably the same yeah. price. Or even something like if you're looking at a Note 10 Lite, you can yeah. look at a Note 9. That's yeah. pretty much the same processor. Yeah. It's still a great phone, you know, yeah. with a great screen. So why do these exist? Exactly. So <laughs> we don't, we don't yeah. know yet. Um, I think uh, Samsung is it, it's, it's making it worse for the market. It's just one of the strategies uh, manufacturers are like, trying to get more people to buy more of their devices is just pumping the market with as many variants and variables as possible. Yeah, so it doesn't matter which you buy as long as you buy my device, yeah, right? Yeah, so it could be that, but I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a shame because the Galaxy S and the Note brand is something of like a, you know, like a flagship. It's almost sacred, I'd say, <laughs> to fans, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Okay, then we're, talk- we're talking about phones, right? So now we're going to like kind of paint a picture of the future in the next 12 months in the year of 2020. So you're going to expect the... We already know this first quarter, um, S20, there's going to be two variants. Um, the specs, I think we have uh, a rough guide of the specs and how it's going to look like. It's big on the camera. Yeah, so they're going to go double down on camera and then... Uh, with the S10, you're gonna uh, sorry. With the S20, you're gonna expect to see the P40 mm-hmm. Pro. Uh, that's coming out towards the end of the first quarter. Which we've also gotten like a leak uh, image of. Yeah, you yeah. can you can see all this on on our website. Yeah. But here's the sad thing. Um, while we were talking about cars just now, you know, I was excited and I could paint a f- picture of what you can expect to see in 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 cars uh, this year and moving forward. With regards to phones, uh, we're still kind of lumbering and slowly moving forward. Um, I'm not seeing something significantly different uh, from the at least first quarter of launches that's going to come out. So you, I, you're going to get like better camera, more camera, more features, and better, bet, uh, more battery, uh, more screen, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there also, is one other thing though. Mm, what is it? The folding smartphone. Uh, like the okay, there's gonna be a new Samsung folding phone. Yeah, not not just the Samsung folding phone, like okay. the folding phone in general. Mm-hmm. Because actually, last year I, the the folding phone that I was most impressed with, or I recently found out in this, or I only found out this year, is actually the Moto Razr, which I got to see in CES. Mm. Now that phone is like very easy to bash, right? Because it's a number one, it's a 720p screen. Mm. Uh, it's a Snapdragon 710, which is like a mid-range processor. Mm. But it costs like what six thousand ringgit, something ridiculous like that. But the thing that the Moto Razr, I think, got the most right mm. is the folding mechanism. Mm. So with the Galaxy Fold, which uh, I mean has right here, mm. you can very clearly see that there is a line down the middle, <laughs> you know? And if you fold it, like, hi, I can see you through it. It's like, uh, what? The gap, yes, you know? Yes. But with the Moto, and also... <laughs> yes. Mm. The but hinge is starting to give. The hinge is starting to on loosen the, on a the little yes, on yes. the phone. So, <laughs> the, oh my <laughs> so the thing, so if in case you are listening uh, via podcast, mm. foreshadowing. <laughs> I mean, almost dropped his Galaxy <laughs> phone. So the thing about the Moto Razr, however, mm. is that it folds really, really well. So you know how a flip phone, you go like, and then. Yeah, that's the trademark of that's the razor. The I, I remember having one and putting my finger into the slot and then... And just like, yeah, yeah. just like getting I, it on yeah, the corner like and putting it yes, out. Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. So uh. you can do that. Like the hinge is that smooth, you know? It's just smooth enough to open nicely, but also stiff enough to hold it in place. Mm. And when you flip it open, thanks to the way it, 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 it sort of folds the screen in, which is, you know, that like weird eight, number eight shape, it actually has a much less noticeable crease. It's mm. there's still a little bit of like a bit of warping near mm. the edge, mm. but it's not nearly as obvious as the Galaxy Fold. Mm. And because of the way it folds, it actually folds completely flush, mm. which is really really impressive. Mm. There's no give in the in the in the yep. hinge. Yep. And I think the thing that gave me the most confidence is okay. So in CS, the Samsung booth, if you want to go check out the Galaxy Fold, you actually mm. had to approach like a counter and talk to the guy behind it. Mm. And he'll pass you a phone to mm. maybe try. 
the Moto Razr, they just had it stuck to the wall like some common cheap <laughs> smartphone for everybody to fondle. Yeah. And like, you know, that sort of like, whoa, okay, so they're that confident mm. in their smartphone. That mm. sort of inspired a bit of confidence mm. in me that their folding mechanism is like already that good. Mm. But you know, this is the, the, the caveat here is that the Galaxy Fold's hinge was, is much older, right? It's like a first, first yeah, generation first gen. product. So the next Fold that we'll yeah. see will probably be much better. And it is still uh, the only uh, device that's in market. The only foldable device that's available in the market outside of China. So yes. apparently the, the Mate, X. Mate X is available in China, uh, but that doesn't count because yeah. uh, I think that's a, a poor execution of a folding device because again, I've spoken about this, the the, dis the folding display is on the outside and it's plastic and it's prone to scratches. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> so this is the first sort of in-folding design that I think is like it, because it, it tackles, uh, yeah, it tackles uh -huh. two two levels of difficulty, mm. right? Where, where it's folding inwards mm -hmm. without like a very obvious crease mm. or a gap, mm. and it's also really really sturdy. So mm. the Galaxy, the, the Mate X had a really nice fold too, mm. but it folded outwards. So it was like a, I don't want to say an easy way out, but yeah. it was a more simpler way to execute yeah. the fold without leaving a gap. Yeah. Well, I guess if you want to have also another prediction of what's going to happen in, in 2020, um, folding phones will become more accessible. So obviously the first generation, uh, the Galaxy uh, Fold and the Huawei Mate X are like super premium products. Uh, Samsung is going to come up with a new uh, folding device. It's going to be called the Galaxy Fold Z, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not going to replace the Galaxy Fold. It's going to be targeted to a different segment. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be cheaper than the Galaxy Fold, maybe less features, um, but it's making foldable devices uh, more accessible. Also the Razer, I don't know whether that's going to come to Malaysia. Uh, there's no presence, uh, at Motorola doesn't no, have an official or like yeah, a strong presence not in a big the country. Um, so you're in, I don't think that's going to come. But on the other side, it might be the Halo product that Motorola wants to bring in. Possible. But I don't think so either because nobody's going to buy a 6,000 ringgit Motorola because they, they are, they're not familiar with the brand in Malaysia. And so I don't know, what do you guys think? Let me know. Uh, folding phones, uh, is it a big deal? And um, let me just fold something in here real <laughs> quick. Um, folding laptops, uh -huh. something that we can also expect, expect more of. Um, that was actually one of the big laptop themes in CES. And I got to check out the ThinkPad X1 Fold, mm. which is uh, Lenovo's new ThinkPad mm -hmm. that folds. Okay. Wow. Thank you, right? As um, the name suggests. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. And the thing that uh, was actually uh, most impressive to me was how confident they were of the durability of the laptop. Because, okay. you know, that was something I brought up. Like, if you look at the Galaxy Fold, it's like fragile, you know. Like, people just sneeze at it and it was like... <laughs> yeah, it the is first fragile. Version, right? so, so when I saw the, something like the ThinkPad X1, and if you ever use the ThinkPad, you know that those laptops are designed to take a beating, you mm. know. Most, almost all of them have military uh, standard testing, mm. you know, they put it through because these are business laptops that are given to, you know, employees of mm. big companies and they're not going to take care, they're not going to baby the laptop. Mm. So the ThinkPad X1 Fold, what they told me, what Lenovo told me was that it had to meet that standard. Mm. So they made sure to stress test it properly, so it has to be durable enough to survive mm. and it also had to be, and here's the, the most interesting mm. part, it also had to be repairable or serviceable. Oh, okay. It's a folding device that you can repair and service. So apparently if you flip it over, now I didn't get to see this, mm. they didn't show me the demo, but if you f uh, flip it on uh, its flip it on its back, flip it on its front. Just yeah. turn it upside down. La. Yeah, turn it upside <laughs> down. You can actually unscrew the bottom panel, uh. remove the whole thing and mm. actually work on the components on the inside. I don't know if like you can replace RAM and stuff uh -huh. like that, but they said that it is serviceable and repairable, mm. which is, you know, Pretty impressive, right? Mm -hmm. That a laptop like that can... Yeah, it's cool that they mentioned, yeah. they put that in the design brief to make it that repairable. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, like, they really thought about how do we make a ThinkPad fold mm. rather than how do we make a folding laptop yeah. that then That's, just slap the ThinkPad yeah, name yeah, yeah, to, to yeah, gain recognition. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. we saw a lot more, I also saw a lot more uh, announcements, like Dell had a folding laptop. Mm. Uh, I believe uh, several uh, ma PC manufacturers had a folding laptop at mm. CES. I didn't get to see them though. Mm. I was uh, mostly focused on the X1 Fold. So mm. yeah, that's something you can expect moving forward. Yeah, well, I guess you can, but I'm not sure whether a folding laptop is something I can get excited about. I mean like, okay, mm. you fold the clamshell mm -hmm. and there's a display at the bottom, right? Mm. Is that is that So, so the, it replaces the keyboard? Yeah, yes. But mm. you can also, I don't know if you've seen the Surface Duo announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft was going all in on like dual screen slash Folding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. with the Windows 10 X, I believe is what it's called, or is it the Windows 10 10? 
Windows 10 X, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so okay. that that version mm. um, is designed to support this kind of folding uh, devices. So, that, so then that they showed off a pretty really designed to yeah. support foldable devices. And some of the the concepts they showed off was pretty cool. So you mm. could use it with a keyboard. So um, you could, if you wanted a big screen, you could mm. open it up, put it like this, mm. and then use a keyboard like that. Mm. You know, like a Bluetooth keyboard. Mm. Or if you you don't have space, you know, you could just flip it over, put mm. it on your lap, put a keyboard on the screen, and it takes over the bottom part of the display. Oh. Yeah, so you can mm. use part of the screen to sort of uh, as a trackpad mm -hmm. and then use the keyboard to type. Okay. Yeah, so that, that, that was some of the things that Microsoft showed off. I and guess uh, that's something... Yeah, which okay, is... Okay, I can, I can look forward to that. I think that's okay. something pretty cool, especially mm. if you're like, you know, uh, into the portability. Yeah, but it's like the convert convertible thing again, right? So I was like really big on convertible uh, yeah. laptops, uh, yes. like the Surface and the Lenovo Mix. Uh, I like that I could like flip it into a tablet. I like the idea. But after like two years of using the Surface Pros and the Lenovo Mix, I realized, hey, I use the tablet mode like almost never. <laughs> never. <laughs> because Windows devices are really terrible at being a tablet. And it's so cumbersome because I cannot put it in my lap because of the form factor. Yeah, yeah the keyboard's and, and, yeah, and, too. Uh, yeah. And the keyboard's like flapping all over the place. <laughs> I like the idea, but I think I've grown to, to learn that, you know, all these convertible things uh, might not work. But again, uh, what I also said is that those are the iterations before 2020. Yeah. The Frankenstein, clunky, rudimentary executions. So pop hopefully in 2020, you will be able to see like all these things being refined to almost perfection in a way that, hey, there's really no compromise. So I don't know. Mm. Okay, so moving forward, um, what is next in on your list of CES? Highlights? The Insta360 ONE R. Okay. So okay. this was okay, uh, yeah, very mm -hmm. interesting. We're moving on to a different topic. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it's yeah, a yeah. very interesting device because it is, quote unquote, the world's first modular action camera. Now, action cameras, as you already know, um, is a GoPro, basically. You know, <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it, it's like a jacuzzi or Maggie. Like a Tablet is an iPad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you have that kind of, of, of association with it. And in Malaysia, GoPro's yeah. branding is really, really strong. Yeah, in strong. fact, all over the world is really, really yeah. strong. Uh, so when they released their Hero 8 and called it modular, mm. I first saw it, I was like, wow, okay, this mm. is pretty cool. You know, you could strap a mic to it, you mm. strap a light to it, mm. and then it's like a vlogging setup. Mm. But the problem with th those is you have the action camera body, and then you just put on like accessories. Mm. So I don't know if you really call them modular per se. You don't actually change the function mm. of the action camera. Um, another thing is that once you strap those attachments, mm. it loses all water resistance mm. and uh, it's no longer as durable because the bits can break off. Yeah. So with the Insta360 ONE R, it's a little bit different because mm. the whole camera itself can be swapped around. So the Insta360 ONE R is made up of three main components. You've mm. got the battery, You've got the brain and you've got the lens and sensor. Mm. So the brain is where the screen is, is where all processing is, is where you plug uh, your cables to char. Uh, sorry, you plug your cables for data transfer. You plug your SIM card, uh, SIM card, blah, your SD card inside, mm. uh, and then you know that takes care of that. Mm. And then the lens slash sensor is the lens and sensor. So you get to swap different modules. So this is the main component that you get to swap you get to switch between, right now they have three different lenses. They have the standard wide angle one. Mm. They have the 360 one, which Insta360 made a name for themselves yep. for being you know, affordable 360 cameras. Yep. And then also you have the Leica co-developed uh, lens. So the Leica co-developed lens is, has a one inch sensor, mm. which is the same kind of sensor you find in like an RX100 or like the DJI Mavic. Pro, uh, Mavic 2 Pro. It's so a substantial sensor. It's a substantial uh, sensor for that form factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't think you've ever seen it before in like an action camera. Yeah. And it has Leica optics, you know, co-developed together with uh, Insta360. Mm. So the cool thing about this is that, you know, the difference between this and the GoPro Hero 8's modularity mm. is that this changes the fundamental function of the action camera. Mm. So if you want, um, let's say you're like, okay, I'm going to mount it to my helmet. Mm. I'll put on the wide angle one, mount it there. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and like, oh sh I actually want like mm. 360 mm. view, stick it out the back, right? Mm. Just like, you don't need to have a second camera, you mm. can just like, <laughs> and then put it there, and mm. it all goes into like the same SD card, you know, and it all has the same battery. Yeah. You just, just put it there, and then you have a 360 camera. Mm. And then you're like, oh, but now I want to shoot like cinematic, or like, maybe it's low light, I mm. don't know. Swap on the, the Leica lens, and it's, it's, it's that easy. It's literally plug and 
play, mm. which mm. is really, really impressive. Plus, despite the fact it is three, it's in three separate parts, mm. it's still water resistant down to five meters. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> modular stuff. Uh, okay, so <laughs> imagine this. Here's the, here's the flip side of that, right? Uh, you're on the road and you're shooting and you want everything to work, right? Um, let's say I'm riding my motorcycle and I got my gloves on and I got to change the camera, right? That's this finicky slider that, you, that locks all the thing in place. So I take off my gloves, I got to like slide that thing, take the other modular thing and put it on and then make sure it works, it's connected and everything. Make sure you, you've got all the things sealed tight. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I always feel that, uh, okay, it's cool and it's awesome that they do it and they can make this work. It's like really polished. Um, I guess pros like it to be modular. I don't know because, you know, the, the guys behind the camera, they use cameras that have um, different lenses yep. and different mics and things that you can take out and put in. It works, but in this form factor, you just want something that I can like take it, put it, check it, and then it's done. I, I don't want to lose um, like contact covers. I don't want to, I don't know. I, I like the Insta360 camera. Uh, I think it's one of the best uh, action, tr actually it's the only 360 action camera that ah. you should get, you should get. Oh, okay. Um, Cause it, it works because because it's like so amazing. Um, I think they're super bold and brave in doing the Insta three sixty one R with the modular thing, and and I'm not uh, discounting that the modular components are very well thought of. Yep. So they have the three sixty, and then they have the wide angle, and they have the other one. Which one? The Leica one. The the Leica the one. one. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's very well thought of. I mean, it's super useful. But I guess maybe it's just me as a user. That modular thing is not something I'm like into, lah. And, and I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair point because if you look at the history of modular devices, mm. I mean, it's not a really great history there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of them are, st are still yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, mm. exactly. So mm. uh, I think in this case, the way I look at something modular is like, does it work? First of all, if you never want to touch any of the other modules. Yeah. And I think uh, as a standalone. Yes. Uh -huh. And I think for Insta 360, it does kind of do that. Yes. Of course, I don't know about image quality because I haven't mm. gotten to test one mm. yet. Mm. Uh, Insta 360, if you want to hook me up, a review <laughs> in it. Um, but the other thing is also, I think there are two inherent benefits, mm. right? First of all, is uh, upgradability down the line. Mm. Let's say Insta 360 comes out with a better sensor or mm. better lens technology comes out, you can just buy the lens component, which will be aff more affordable than buying like a whole camera. Yeah. You know, and then if let's say your lens gets damaged, mm. you don't have to buy a whole new action camera again. Yep. You just swap yeah, the piece out. Yep. You know, uh, and I think it's also better for people like uh, consumer, mm. like more uh, amateur consumers or mm. prosumers. You know, mm. people who don't have quite the budget to buy a million different GoPros yeah. or a million different you know 360 yeah. cameras and mount them everywhere. Yeah. You have the option. To you know, sec to to trade off to trade that off mm. with a bit of time to do maybe the stun twice mm. from two different angles. Yep, so yep, those yep. are like the the benefits. Of course, in practice, we don't know how effective it yeah. will be. Yeah. So that will have to. Well, there there, there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't wait to give this a try as well, and then we'll see how it goes. Okay. So let's move on to the next thing. All right. The final thing for me. Um, final already. Final thing. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. It looks like a long list. It's a uh, oh point yeah, this. But we've been okay. doing a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the final thing that mm. I saw was uh, TVs. I didn't get to spend a lot of time in there, but yeah. I could understand from what watch I watch TV. Yeah. yeah, I know, right? I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm like, this is my TV. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even watch stuff on my iPad. <laughs> It's, it's just on my board, phone, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but surprisingly, they do. Because okay. TV is really big in CES. Yeah. And uh, one of the it's biggest the developments. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Yeah. They're all one. You know, um, they're all they're always like, my flat screens. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You need the flat screens. Okay, anyway. Sorry if people who are from America. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I just like offended yeah. so many people. I'm so sorry. Mark Hamill. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to cut that because it's not relevant anymore. Oh boy. Okay, anyway. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh. yeah, I think we, we, we went a bit too far <laughs> with that. Anyway, mm. one of the biggest developments in CES regarding TVs mm. is, uh, or even in TVs in general, is mm -hmm. this new technology called micro LED. Currently, I'm sure you're familiar with like TV technology. It's mostly into two different yeah, camps, right? Know you've got like, is, yeah. You've got like a. Uh, I have an understanding. But just in case, you know, the viewers <laughs> don't know, you know, let me just share. Okay. So you have the standard sort of um, uh, backlit 
technology, which yeah. is like LED, LCD TVs, yeah. and then you have the OLEDs, which yeah. are self-emitting diodes, mm -hmm. right? So they, the backlit is, there's a backlight, there's an RGB color layer, and then there's what you see on the screen or whatever filter it is to, to tweak the colors. Yeah. And on the OLED, it's just one panel because the lights, the pixels themselves, yeah. they can emit their own light, so yeah. they don't need a backlight mm -hmm. to run through. It has always been split into these two categories because these are the two different kinds of technologies. Mm -hmm. So OLED, the benefits of that is great contrast ratio, yeah. um, usually pretty Pretty good picture quality, super, super great black, colors, black, yeah. yeah, super black blacks, yeah. like unbeatable kind of yeah, blacks, like black. Yeah. yeah, even even the best sort of like a QLED sort of quantum dot, yeah. almost like quantum dot kind of technology yeah. from Samsung, just doesn't really compare with yeah. a, like an OLED. Yeah. OLED TVs can be really slim because the panel is really thin. Because mm. so, you don't need the backlight. Yes, yep. exactly. Mm. You don't need the layers. Mm. So. But the drawback for an OLED is that mm. these are organic uh, self-emitting diodes, yeah. right? So, so they wear organic wear means yeah. they don't have a great lifespan. Yeah. You know, they yeah. wear really quickly. They die. That's why. That's yeah. why. Yeah, exactly. Literally, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's why OLED screens are always you know susceptible to burning. Yeah. Um, that's why Samsung only uses OLED screens for their smartphones. Mm. They don't use it for TV. their TVs because well, smartphones, space. like you yeah. know, you change every two two years, maybe yeah. every year. Yeah. So yeah. it's not such a big issue. And the screen is not always on. Exactly. Like a yeah. TV. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So. Uh, the difference, so that was always the drawback of OLED. OLED but then, yep. in uh, when you move over to the other side, you know you don't have the great contrast, yeah. and then uh, the panels are fatter. Mm. But with micro LED, it sort of takes the benefits, the strengths of OLED, mm -hmm. and marries it with some of the benefits and strengths of uh, traditional backlit TVs. Okay. So micro LED technology, like in a nutshell, I'm not I'm not an expert on this, mm. so don't don't you know come come to me with your pitchfork. The gist of it. Yeah, yeah. the gist of it is yeah. that each pixel has three micro LEDs that are self-emitting, so okay. you don't need a back layer, a back so layer. So one pixel is like one teeny. Yes, one like, teeny. You know, if you look at your phone and and, yeah. and you <laughs> look at it like really closely and you can see a square, yes. that's a pixel. Exactly. Yeah. So that small thing has three micro LEDs in it so that each pixel yeah. can now emit its own okay, light. Okay, so people for, for for people who are listening to this on a podcast, hopefully, a pixel is probably the size of a like the like uh, a tip full of stop. A pin. Yeah, yeah. On on a on a on a on your screen. Depends on the font size. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, font size. Okay. basically, it's uh, really, really yes, tiny. Yes, yes, okay, yes. so uh -huh. in that tiny little dot is three, uh, three different LEDs. So these LEDs emit their own light. So you don't need. That means you don't need a backlight layer. Yep. That also means that each individual pixel can be turned off in the same way that an OLED can be turned yes. off. So you get the same kind of contrast ratios. Mm. But because LEDs are non-organic, mm. they have a better lifespan. Yep. And uh, the, one of the re other reasons companies like Samsung you know, shy away from OLED mm. is because OLED uh, doesn't get super bright. So from what I've read, that OLEDs usually, you know, they peak at about a thousand, a little more than a thousand nits. Mm. But with micro LED, Samsung's current uh, micro LED TVs, they're already shipping with like 4,000 nits. And the potential uh, is that it can go up to 10,000 nits. Wow. So for that's HDR, like a projector. yeah, that's like really, so you really need like, you know, this kind of technology if you want like really realistic lighting mm. for HDR content. Mm. Another thing is that uh, micro LEDs are also, in the long run, they're going to be more uh, cost efficient to produce. Mm. They are also more energy efficient. Mm. Um, they are also, let me just look at my notes here. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. And, 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 and no, no, yeah, and the yeah. panels can also be theoretically slimmer than OLEDs. Yes. Yeah. But the, mm. the reason why micro LED TVs were challenging to produce is mm. because, you know, each pixel has three different lights. And to get that, uh, lined up with all the other pixels mm. who all have their own three lights mm. and make sure there's no difference in brightness quality, mm. there's no difference in like, you know, um, just getting Alignment everything to, la, yeah, to line up sequ properly. Sequencing. La. Exactly. So that yeah. was a very big challenge yeah, for that. Yeah. But once they've nailed it, once they've nailed that, uh -huh. you know, micro LED will probably just So this like is developed by Samsung, Samsung, is it? Uh, it's not by Samsung. Uh, LG also has their own micro LED. It's basically like the new fangled tech. I believe Sony also has a display of their micro LED mm. technology. Mm. So this is like the new, the next thing in TV. I think it's mm. like the first major development in like 10 years yeah. or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that's one of the things. So uh, Samsung had, I would say one of the more impressive displays yeah. though, they had something called the wall, mm -hmm. which is their wall TV. <laughs> you, you, so I don't know if you watch How I Met Your Mother, but there's this one episode where Barney had yeah. like a he, he the, 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 the gang was in his house and they were mm -hmm. like, don't you have a TV here? He's like, oh yeah, see that wall over there? The, the whole wall turned on as a TV. <laughs> See that wall? <laughs> 300 inch flat screen. They only sell them in Japan, but I know a guy. 
you can do that with the Samsung the Wall TV. So mm. the the way it works is that um, the display the display unit that they had there mm. was two was two hundred and ninety two inches. Can you imagine what a two hundred and ninety two inch Wait, TV 292 is? Two hundred and ninety two inches. Yeah, I don't have okay. to imagine because I saw it was <laughs> huge. It's like massive. So the way okay. they made this work is that. Uh, it's not one panel. It's made up of multiple panels. So uh, the wall TV is comprised of like separate what they call modules. Uh -huh. So each module is 32 and a half inches uh, wide across in diam diagonally. Okay. And then that 292 inch TV is made from like 64 different modules. So they all stick together. And then the most impressive thing is even though there are 64 separate modules, mm -hmm. it looked basically seamless. Like it's one big screen. Like it looks like one big screen. Like yeah, I yeah. couldn't believe my eyes. I got right up to it and I couldn't really, I couldn't even see the seam, which was really impressive. And the image quality, because of the micro LED technology, oh, it really looked good. Like genuinely good. Like, like not washed out. Because generally, like if you have a larger screen, yeah. you lose the detail. You, do, you lose resolution. Uh, the the, the, the lose, light you know. will leak out. The blacks are not as black. Yeah, and another benefit of this modular, te modular technology is that you can configure it to any kind of aspect ratio that you want. Right, mm -hmm. because if like sixteen by nine is not what you want, just move the move the modules over there, and then twenty one by nine, boom, cinematic experience. Two hundred and ninety four, two, two hundred and ninety two, seven meters, <laughs> seven seven point four meters. Exactly, that's really uh, across or across. like diagonally. What the hell? Yeah. That was a huge. It was like I when people were telling me about yeah. that, I was just like, it's just a TV. It's just a really big TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, I yeah. walked into the booth. I was like. Mm. I guess I guess <laughs> it's an experience that you have to like really see to yeah. to, to to experience it, yeah. and I think that brings me to another thing that we're gonna look forward to in the year twenty twenty and beyond, and that is better definition in terms of content. So Astro has already come up with uh, their Ultra Box, which now pushes four K content. Finally, four K content is now available for the masses. So previously, um, we 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 got like full HD content uh, and, and now 4K is available. Um, it's So a lot of people, it's easy to discount and say, oh yeah, 4K is just another better re resolution. And we joked about, oh, who watches TV anymore? <laughs> At the end of the day, it's bringing back that, that epic experience because nothing substitutes uh, size when it comes to viewing, at least. So the bigger the screen, the higher definition, the quality, the more immersive you are, or the more it feels like you're there, or the more real. It's like watching a window. And this is huge because uh, if you watch sports a lot, I think movies too, uh, but sports mainly, it really makes you feel like you're there. Mm. Um, so 4K content is going to be available, accessible to, to people. Um, 4K, uh, what's this? Um, broadcast content. So Astro has just come up with their Ultrabox. I think uh, Unify has also released a box. I'm not sure whether that's 4K. I can't remember. We'll get back to you. Uh, whether it's 4K or not, ping. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the video guys will, will fix that. So uh, content is going to be a big deal. This immersive thing is going to be, be a big deal. TV. Uh, Pricing yeah. for 4K TVs has uh -huh. gone down significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with brands like KUKA, yeah. you know, Sharp, and most major manufacturers yeah, yeah, yeah. right now, you can get like a 4K TV for a super affordable price. Yeah, a bit of a caveat emptor there. You Sometimes you do get what you pay for. Like, so <laughs> KUKA yeah. is cheap, but oh, man. it's not that great. Yeah. Uh, so you can watch our, a review of our KUKA TV uh, done by uh, our friend uh, Nick. Um, and yeah, so we, we were really turned on by the price but we found out also that you could get like cheaper better displays from more reputable brands like yeah. Samsung and, and, and LG okay and uh, that's pretty much it that's a really nice walk through of what you saw in CES um, there's a lot of like really exciting things to look forward to uh, number one for me is obviously automotive um, I'm looking at better quality content as well uh, 4k being accessible that's super cool I'm still a bit wishy-washy on devices. So just a bit of a rundown on when devices are coming out. First quarter, you're going to see the S20, uh, the new Galaxy Fold Z, uh, the P40 Pro. And then after that, it's just going to be like a... Probably a OnePlus flagship in the yeah, middle of the yeah, year. Yeah, probably going to be a OnePlus flagship in the middle of the year. So, but in between the first quarter and the third quarter, because there's two major launch windows, first and third quarter of the year, in between that, you're going to get like all the small small phones coming out, the Realme's, Affordables, the Xiaomi's, yeah. the Mi Mi Mi's, whatever, the Oppo's and the Vivo's. Uh, <laughs> hey, Realme, Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. I just realized that. Okay. And then uh, in the third quarter, uh, you're going to get the Note, probably the Note 20. Uh, and then maybe another folding device from Samsung. I don't know because uh, the Galaxy Fold is due for a replacement. It's mm -hmm. just one year old. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the iPhone's going to, iPhone 12 is going to come out. And uh, Note, uh, Notepad. No, Notepad. <laughs> iPad. <laughs> what's, what's for sure is I'm getting older in 2020. <laughs> so you're gonna get the note happening in in, in, in in quarter three, and also the iPad's gonna come out, and then in between that, new Macs and, and whatever nots are gonna come out, uh, new wearables. So the device cycle, yes, is coming out. I don't know what do you guys think. Are you guys still excited when a new device uh, is coming out? For me, what I see is, uh, especially in, 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 in our content and in uh, our comments and our readers, is that a lot of people are like kind of meh when it comes to flagships. Mm -hmm. They're like, mm, whatever, you know, it's going to be new this, whatever. Yeah. A lot of people are really interested in the mid to and low end yeah. segments. Oh, okay. So that, that, that brings me to another point. What you can expect in 2020 and beyond uh, mid and low end phones are going to be better and better and They're better. They're going to be really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Like well, genuinely really Last good. year we saw like a number of not not so called flagship. I hate the word flagship <laughs> killer. I hate the word killer in everything because <laughs> nothing gets killed when something new comes out because people always want choices. If that's the case, right, then I would say Burger King was touted as the McDonald's killer. <laughs> but McDonald's still around, okay? Um, what was like the really impressive mid-tier flagship you saw last year? Um, it, it wasn't one flagship in particular, mm. but it's rather the kind of technologies that you see in like these premium uh, mid-range or affordable mid-range devices mm. that you would normally find in like really high-end devices. Or mm. even sometimes high-end devices don't have stuff like high refresh rate screens. Mm. You know, we saw that on the um, Realme X2 Pro. Mm. That was like a what, 2000, or even the OnePlus 7T, mm. I believe, that has a high refresh rate screen. So high refresh rate screens at affordable price points, like below 3000, mm. maybe 2, 4, 2, 3, mm. that was really impressive. Uh, then we also have something like this, which is like the Mi Note 10, which mm. has uh, a very capable camera system in terms of like hardware, but mm. the software still needs a lot of work. Mm. Um, and yeah, so like stuff like this, if we can see more of this in yeah. the future, right? Bigger batteries, proper stereo speakers, mm. right? That's another thing that Realme X2 Pro had, which mm. was like proper stereo speakers that sounded great. By proper, you mean they are placed on the left? Left. Or right. So well, if you place yeah. the phone uh, diagonally, uh, not diagonally, horizontally, it's at the left and right. Yes, but it's closer to like the iPhone style where yeah. it's uh, earpiece and yeah. Bottom firing, but yeah. it's very balanced. And the proper one means the usually the top one, which is also the earpiece, right? Yeah. When you hold the phone like a phone. Uh, normal uh, stereo speakers, the earpiece is weaker than the bottom firing. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, you know, a speaker, you have the, the tweeter and yeah, the, yeah. the woofer, yeah, woofer, something yeah. like that. Yeah. But no, this is like left, right. Yeah. yeah. So you have uh, technology like that coming mm. in. And the best part about uh, buying sort of affordable flagships mm. or affordable devices is that they tend to come with headphone jacks. So mm. if you're still big on headphone jacks, you know, you can still expect yeah. to see them in the affordable price ranges, but now these smartphones also have like high-end flagship mm. features. Mm. Yeah. So that's something really exciting. Mm. But uh, beyond hardware, yeah, I know it's easy to get excited about hardware. Mm. I'm more excited about developments in software. Mm. Because one thing that I know is that hardware is like really good with, as it yeah. is right now on smartphones, but the software still needs a lot of work. Yeah. Like, the folding phone, for example, I just don't think like Android is is there yet mm. for like the folding experience. For certain apps, lah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I've been using the phone for a while now. It's my daily driver. I like that I can. I think the multi screen is quite seamless. Mm -hmm. But Instagram and Facebook is very is but, terrible. But don't you think with like such a next gen device, mm. there should be a next gen experience as well? Hmm. You know, I I don't know. I mean, I mean the multi screen thing. I, okay, uh, maybe. But I cannot conceptualize what yeah. next gen exactly. experience means. So, so I don't know what that's gonna look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm excited to see. So yeah, like the current versions yeah. of Android, you know, they're really good. Like it's a really nice experience. Mm. iOS is really good, mm. you know. So I can't wait to see like this kind of polish mm. on like the next gen next gen devices <laughs> of the phones yeah. and maybe even something that we don't even know exists yet. Yeah. Because as we found out with folding phones and even Sony's car. Companies can keep a secret if they want to. <laughs> yes. Actually, they can. Okay, okay. Yeah. Leaks are not leaks, like Actually, <laughs> it's just a marketing tool yeah. right now. A lot, yeah. a lot of uh, companies just use it to get free publicity. Mm -hmm. So, 
uh, just a little tip there. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. Um, software is a big deal, but I cannot tell you how it can be improved. I cannot conceptualize how a new f mobile phone experience should be, how a new tablet experience should be. I, I can't. And I guess that's something I'm looking forward to uh, for 2020. So um, phones, technology devices are going to be more affordable, more capable. Uh, I also expect this year would be the year where we will see the death of micro USB ports, oh, at please. least in phones. And finally, proper implementation of USB-C. Because previously, USB-C is like kind of <laughs> scattered. So some ports can charge, some ports cannot charge. Charging ports can transfer data, but cannot transfer image, uh, video. So um, we will see the USB finally becoming the standard and we will see uh, all USB ports, what I expect and I hope, uh, all USB ports to be able to charge and do everything that you expect from yeah. the USB-C port. Rather than like having a USB-C head, but then the cable is like basically micro USB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's a look ahead in what's going to happen in 2020 and beyond. And thank you, Rory, for recapping uh, all the cool things that My you pleasure. saw in uh, 2020. As always, guys, if, if there's uh, anything you want us to cover or talk about, please uh, share them in the comment section. Um, any, any questions or whatever that you'd like us to answer, uh, any suggestions, let us know. We're, we're, we're super excited, more than happy to make this show better and better for you guys. So before we wrap up, any final words from you, Rory Lee? No. That's the final word. Okay, guys, thanks very much for watching. Uh, thanks very much for subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, give us a like if you enjoy watching the video. Please drop us a comment if, you want, if you'd like or would uh, want to suggest how we can make this video better as always for you guys. So to everybody that's Chinese and celebrating Chinese New Year, uh, I hope I do this, I do this correctly. Kong si fa chai. Um, and to everybody that's not Chinese, happy holidays, everybody. Um, that's the best part of being Malaysian. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Uh, this is Amin, and that's Rory. And this is Uh Thanks very much. Catch you guys later. Bye. Bye. It shouldn't be this is Let's Talk About. <laughs>